This is Business, Equity, and Opportunities. Welcome to Wish TV's Business, Equity, and Opportunities. I'm Scott Sander. This show speaks directly to entrepreneurs to help educate and inform, to provide you with necessary information to develop the skills needed to start and run a successful small business. The information comes straight from those who know, business owners and community leaders who join us to share their experiences to help pave the way for others. Our goal is to present useful and compelling content that focuses on diversity, equity, and opportunities in the business community. Every week we feature seven segments, each covering important and often forgotten topics critical to starting and running a small business. If you already own a business, you'll also find useful information to help with the day-to-day -day operations. You can watch the show every week here or catch the live stream on wishtv.com. You can access all of our content and share it on demand at beoshow.com. Visit often as we update our resources and segments every week. Coming up on today's Business Equity and Opportunities, we look at the stock market. As volatile as it can be, big swings can cause real concerns, but also possibly provide opportunities for most small businesses. We talk with market expert Jane King for perspective about what to look for and how and when the numbers really matter. Our industry focus turns to accounting and bookkeeping. We'll get tips on when and why you need to call in a pro. And former football star turned entrepreneur Gary Brackett shares life lessons that he learned in his playing days and how over the years he has redefined success. Our first segment in every business equity and opportunity show is Getting Started. This week a top banking executive offers his insights into what every entrepreneur should consider when beginning a journey to business ownership. This is Business Equity and Opportunities. Getting started. Tim Spence is the new CEO for Fifth Third Bank and offers some sound advice on how to go from the idea stage to taking the first step on the road to a new business reality. Get started. That would be it. In my own career, I always experienced this like writer's block. Uh, you get, you know, you have an idea, you want to set out to do something. A lot of the best ideas die uh, before they ever get started, right? And. There are, from my own experience in working in startups, you learn so much more once you're in the market than you ever do uh, when you're standing at a chalkboard or a dry erase board and trying to figure out how to go, right? So the faster that you can get feedback from real customers, the faster that you're actually running uh, the, the business, uh, the, the more that you learn. I, I think that would be advice number one. Advice number two would be, I think people are too reticent to reach out to mentors uh, and to people who have been there and done that and to ask them for input and advice. There's no higher compliment that you can pay to somebody who's built a business than to ask them uh, to give you input on your own. You know, I certainly in my career, I've benefited from not only my own experience, but the experience I was able to gain just by learning from other people and uh, what they had been through as it related to either tackling a specific business problem or figuring out how to add talent from outside the company uh, or how to scale. My career wouldn't be what it is if there hadn't been three or four or five people along the way who took a special interest in me uh, and who has inspired me to think bigger about what uh, I accomplished. So that certainly uh, has been a, you know, a big and defining moment. I think the other one is we all, all of us who were in business faced a pretty defining moment uh, a few years ago, the first day that the lockdown was announced. Uh, and the inspiration I've taken away from the way that our people respond to that moment, the lessons in leadership uh, that I gained as we figured out how to retool our operations to be able to work in a COVID environment, how to take care of people, uh, because as an essential business, about half of our workforce, uh, their first day back into the office was the day after the lockdown was announced, and how to adapt as we have come to learn more about how to navigate COVID-19, which is tremendously valuable. I always tell our people that I'm a big believer in the value of a blank sheet of paper, right? Uh, I, the, the big breakthroughs come from fresh perspectives on how to solve old problems, 
right? Not from solving old problems a little bit differently than they were done before. So for people who are starting businesses, I always really encourage them to spend, like, spend the time that's required to really think through uh, what the issues are with the way that somebody handles their books today in our business, right? Or how somebody plans for and saves for college, right? Uh, or the ways in which we think about how we spend our free time. And then you want to deconstruct those problems uh, in ways that really allow you to understand how you can bring new technology or new solutions or better advice uh, and education to the process for your customers. When we come back, we'll meet a new business owner whose participation in last year's Love Thy Neighborhood Awards turned out to be an unexpected, non-traditional funding opportunity. And later, we'll learn how one local business owner's early mentors put him on the road to business success. If you'd like more information about this segment, be sure to visit us online at beoshow.com. And if you have any questions or you'd like to be part of our show, please email us at beo at wishtv.com. We'd love to hear from you. This is Business Equity and Opportunities. We'll be right back. Getting started. Made possible by the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. is business, equity, and opportunities. Welcome back to Business Equity and Opportunities. Our next topic is access to capital. When it comes to accessing capital, for a new business, there are non-traditional community opportunities you may not be aware of, things you can apply for, including small business grants and other forms of awards from organizations. One such group is LISC Indianapolis and its annual Love Thy Neighborhood Awards. The awards recognize community organizations that have a positive impact on the livability, opportunity, vitality, and education of their community. They call it the Love Model. This is Business, Equity, and Opportunities, Access to Capital. Dr. David Hampton, Executive Director for LISC Indianapolis, explains how the LISC organization is helping communities build stronger neighborhoods. Plus, we meet one of the winners of last year's LISC Love Thy Neighbor Awards to learn how that event helped open doors for their business. I think the key is just never give up. Uh, you have to learn how to uh, view every obstacle as a potential opportunity. Find the opportunities in your obstacles because there are going to be many along the way. And especially when you're a business owner, um, you know, this is, this is your baby. This is something that you have birthed, right? This is something that has lived with you and an outgrowth of you. So you know what's best for you. And so you have to look for opportunities that work for you. And uh, those that don't, you have to, you know, know how to move on. Uh, some doors are going to get shut in your face. And that's okay, keep knocking. Many businesses fail, but some of the greatest success stories come from you know, the greatest failures. Failure is not final, and a delay is not a denial. Um, and I would say you know, for other individuals who are, who are struggling in business, find resources, uh, inform yourself. There are a plethora of resources, which is you know, why I'm glad that we're talking about LISC as a, as a resource, but find out re what resources are available to you and it's also important to be realistic and practical. Know where you are, know where you want to go, and then ensure that you have laid the foundation to get from point A to point B. LISC steps in to really be an intermediary. Um, we provide technical assistance, capacity building. You know, we are really honored to partner alongside organizations that actually do the work. We're glad to help fund uh, that work, but we don't actually build houses. We don't actually provide uh, the services. Uh, we don't actually do job training. We don't actually do healthcare, but we finance and fund healthcare and 
uh, home repair and uh, we want to engage in those spaces so that again we can uh, really improve uh, neighborhoods and, and the economic resilience of our neighborhoods. So we also operate from what we call uh, a love model. Love means livability, opportunity, vitality, uh, and education. When we look for neighborhoods that perhaps lack one or all of those sort of dynamics and we look to strengthen. So how can we build the educational infrastructure around this neighborhood? How can we create um, uh, a more livable uh, neighborhood. Perhaps a neighborhood needs sidewalks. Perhaps businesses need uh, facades that are uh, um, sort of revitalized. We provide facade grants. We provide small business grants. Uh, we look to partner with uh, job training opportunities, educational opportunities. So we try to fund a wide range of services so that neighborhood organizations and businesses can thrive where they are. I was introduced to uh, LISC actually during uh, COVID. During COVID, uh, we were introduced, you know, we had our initial meeting. Uh, I love the concept. I read about LISC, you know, and the services that they provide. I thought they were just a, a company based in Indianapolis and found out, you know, they're all over helping different businesses to propel. So I was very interested in working with them. We've developed a great relationship with them. So um, to apply and to win this award, it meant the world to me. It gave me a lot of resources that I need, you know, working with them to help a lot of other businesses. We service over 500 businesses. This is history making for us to be here in the She Experience shops here at Circle Center Mall. And to win that award, that gave us some of the capital that we needed to move into the store, you know, get things arranged so that we get open for our grand opening, you know, cause we are the first black department store here in Circle Center Mall. This mall has never had this many black owned businesses in this mall at one time. So being here is, it's monumental for us. You know, this is history making for us. This has never been done before. We hope that our grandkids will read about us one day, you know, in the history books. Wish TV is proud to partner with LISC Indianapolis again this year to present the Love Thy Neighborhood Awards. You'll be able to find out who this year's winners are and vote for the new People's Choice winner. We have more information available on our website, beoshow.com. Up next, in This Week in Business, we turn our attention to the economy. Successful business owners know the importance of staying on top of the latest local news, but should that include keeping an eye on what's happening with the stock markets? Find out when Business Equity and Opportunities returns. This is Business, Equity, and Opportunities. Welcome back to Business, Equity, and Opportunities. The swings of the stock market are constantly in the news, and that may give you the impression that it's all about big business. Not so, say the experts. They say you should definitely pay attention to what's happening on Wall Street. Every morning on Wish TV's Daybreak, Jane King breaks down the news of business, and she's joining us now for Business Equity and Opportunities. Uh, Jane, before we go any further, for those who don't know you through Daybreak, yes, you're at the NASDAQ, but you're very much of Indiana. Share your background with our friends. Oh, yeah. No, I grew up uh, in a little town called Greentown in Howard County, so near Kokomo. Right. Went to Purdue. Um, I even interned at Wish when I was in college. So it's <laughs> like, I uh, go back home. In fact, my whole family is still there. They still live in the Howard County area. I have some family near Indianapolis and of course, lots of friends from college and high school as well. So I go back to Indiana, I'd say four times a year probably. And we'll soon have a list of small business entrepreneurs that you may want to come visit when you do. Talk to them. You are of course at the heart of Wall Street right now. When you think of how the markets impact the entrepreneur, the small business owner, what are the thoughts that come to you? 
Well, you know, of course the stock market is made up of large companies. You have to meet certain financial requirements and things before you can list on a public exchange. But this is all interconnected. So the economy is, uh, you know, the things that happen on Wall Street, especially when it comes to confidence. Like if we see the market drop, you know, say like we did in March 2020 when the pandemic first started, 3,000 points, 4,000 points, um, people start to lack confidence and they may not go to their local stores and shop as much. They may not go to the local restaurants and eat out as much. They may pull back on their spending. So all of it is definitely interconnected. And I know a lot of small business owners have money in the stock market or their employees have it through their 401k plans. So all of this is interconnected in the economy. Of course, we've talked a lot lately about the Federal Reserve raising interest rates and small business owners a lot of times will tap uh, those markets for loans that they need for expansions and uh, so the rising interest rates that are impacted by the stock market affects small businesses as well. That's one of those areas that we cover every week. We have seven different categories that we always make sure we touch on. Access to capital clearly runs directly yeah. through the Federal Reserve for the most conventional forms of it. Let's go back to that idea of confidence. You have a gauge of how small business owners are feeling in general about the economy. That's right. So the NFIB, so the National Federation of Independent Businesses, does a study of small business optimism every month. And the most recent one, which just came out a few days ago, had small business optimism at a 48-year low. Um, so, and the main reason was inflation. A lot of these small business owners are dealing with their higher fuel costs, their higher food costs, higher labor costs. That's been a big issue for small businesses. Not being able to find all the workers they need, and then when they do find them, they have to pay up for them. Um, so all of those costs, we're dealing with that really low number that we saw from the NFIB this week. You know, as I listen to you, it occurs to me that in the way that you've taught me and other Daybreak people over the years, the idea of even an earnings report, even if you're not invested in a business, if you are, for instance, in the market for goods, for services, for raw materials, there's a lot to learn by watching the markets. Oh my goodness, there is. I mean, and now more than ever, I think there's so many cross currents that are mm -hmm. going on through the markets right now. We've got, um, you know, a war going on that's been impacting fuel prices. Um, there's all these decisions being made in Washington that are impacting inflation as well. And, uh, you know, we talked, you know, I think of Target just recently, you know, talked about, you know, how they overbought things. And that sent the whole market down because it really was the first thing that made us think, maybe we're headed into a recession. People mm. just start spending. They're pulling back on their spending. So a lot of times, you know, these earnings reports will kind of stand on their own, but a lot of times they impact the whole market as well. We're watching commodities, huge part of the Indiana economy, especially the agricultural economy. Um, those prices have been going down lately as well. So all of it is really interconnected and it's complicated, but it's always very interesting. Yeah, you, you can see both the opportunities and the hurdles sometimes both in the yeah. same sentence, it seems. Uh, back sure. to that idea of, yep. of retailers who've overpurchased, some of that goes directly back to decisions made early on in the pandemic, then adjustments made from time to time to it and through it. Whether we're speaking to new business owners, folks just jumping into all of this, or entrepreneurs who are in it and sort of paddling midstream, uh, where are we with the state yeah. of the uh, pandemic? Well, it certainly feels like we're weaning our way out of it. Mm. Um, I think kind of the public has decided we're done with this, um, even though we keep having new mutations pop up here and there. Uh, but we're still technically in a pandemic and we still don't have the supply chain issues all sorted out yet. A lot of that, of course, the pandemic was global. I mean, it was really unprecedented in terms of the impact that it had globally. Um, and many other countries are not as far along. Some of them just opened up recently, particularly in Asia. So it really has to be the global economy before we really get back to where we were in 2019. All trading days are busy days these days, so we appreciate you taking time for business equity and opportunities, Jane King. Of course, and we'll great always, to be with you. Well, we really appreciate it, and we'll also invite everybody to join us on Daybreak every weekday where Jane gives us perspective as well. Thanks, Jane. Business Equity and Opportunities is proud to present a special announcement from our partners at Business Equity for Indy, which today announced the launch of two key strategies that employers can use to drive racial equity. Stacia Murphy, Director of Equity, Outreach and Strategic Partnership for the Indy Chamber, explains. Last fall, uh, the Business Equity for Indy Learning and Talent Task Force published a report that 
put out some shocking disparities for black and brown students in Marion County. This is really even more evident when you look later on in life at uh, median earnings. Black college graduates, they make about a little less than 36,000 a year compared to Hispanic college graduates who make about 42,000 a year. Uh, this is also compared to white college graduates who make a little over 44000 a year. A lot of Indiana or Indy region employers really recognize that these are barriers. However, they're not quite sure where to start in changing some of these outcomes, which is why the Business Equity for Indy um, Learning and Talent Task Force is very proud to announce two tools today that will help uh, businesses in Indiana region drive some more equity outcomes. So the first one is the Impediments to Health Playbook, which really has tiered best practices that companies can take to drive equity for their workforce. And the second one is an exclusive opportunity to participate in the BEI Workforce Pilot, which is made it possible in support of Richard M. Fairbanks Foundation and the Lumina Foundation. Impediments to Health Playbook has tiered recommendations that each employer can take to really drive equity with health outcomes for their workforce. The BEI Workforce Workforce pilot is actually taking a culmination of three of the Business Equity for Indy task forces. So the learning and talent, which is all about the pipeline, uh, the hiring and promotions is really about what happens when your diverse talent comes into your organization, and then impediments to health and walks with companies on their way to implementation of those best practices. Well, I think employers across the Indy region really recognize this is an imperative for them to be more competitive and to drive innovation. Without a diverse workforce, you don't have diverse perspectives or diverse and creative ways at solving new challenges and problems. And so this really is not just the right thing to do, but it's also about each organization's bottom line. Please visit us online at IndyChamber.com slash BEI Playbook. When we come back, accounting and bookkeeping are among the most important areas any business owner needs to know about. Whether you hire an accountant or handle the numbers yourself, you must have a working knowledge and a sense for business. So how do you get all that? We'll hear from a successful business owner about what and who motivated him. Business Equity and Opportunities will be right back. This is Business, Equity, and Opportunities. Welcome back to Business, Equity, and Opportunities. This week in Accounting and Bookkeeping, we explore how important it is to learn basic business skills to help you make good business decisions. Those skills include a good head for numbers, how you develop that, though, can be different for every person. In some cases, having the right mentors in your life can make all the difference. Today, we find out how one successful business owner credits people in his life for guiding him to the skills that help him be successful today. This is Business, Equity, and Opportunities, Accounting and Bookkeeping. John Thompson's business skills started when he was a small child selling fruit in his neighborhood but it was the people he met growing up that set him on the right path and helped develop his love for numbers and for business. The Lutheran Church put a mission church in my neighborhood, St. Augustine. It's a mission church like you would send to another country, but why is it a mission in, in your own country and in your own state? This is the Lutheran Church of Maryland, but they planted that church because they wanted to help that community. Pastor Goble, who ran that church, I mean, I, he moved in, I was 13 years old, and literally changed my life from, you know, I always wanted to go to college, but I got in trouble a lot. I even got in trouble. I caused him trouble, but he never held it against me. But then he taught us, uh, a, you know, how to prepare for college and got us introduced to programs that would help us perform better on the SAT, 
took us around to visit colleges and took me camping up and down the East Coast from Montreal to St. Augustine, Florida. We camped out. Um, I had been a Boy Scout, so I had learned a fair amount about camping. So at that point, I'm starting to get a sense for what I want to study. You know, I was good in math, good in science, so I chose chemical engineering, but I knew nothing about that career except St. Augustine exposed us to careers we had never heard of. Because in the inner city, you know, doctor, lawyer, teacher, nurse, and social worker, and not much else. I mean, other than that, it's blue collar. You know, there, there were no bankers that we were exposed to or real estate developers or you know, real true entrepreneurs that's building businesses of scale. We're not exposed to anyone like that. So St. Augustine exposed us to those kinds of things. And so I selected chemical engineering as my major. And during my sophomore year, I visited Rome and Haas Chemical in Philadelphia. I spent a week there and worked in many different areas. Old work was exposed to many different areas. And when I was exposed to marketing and sales, I fell in love with that because I had been doing it all my life. And, uh, and it had a lot of benefits that I liked in addition to the career as well. Even though I was a chemical engineering major and chemical engineers tend to go into the factory or design factories or uh, do research, um, I wanted to go straight into marketing and sales, selling chemicals. I had an internship at Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati that was very technical. And then I did a marketing internship at Rome & Haas. I liked the marketing better. To be sure, listening to my professors, I did another technical assignment over the Christmas break, my senior year at Rome & Haas. And, uh, and I knew for sure then that I was strictly going marketing and sales. And so that's what I did. And that was the best preparation I could have had for being in business. I sold chemicals for, for three years, then went back for my MBA. And by then I knew where the gaps were, accounting, finance. But obviously as a chemical engineer, my affinity for numbers is much greater than any graduate business school would ever present to me. So, the, the, the numbers part was easy, you know, like so finance, accounting, I enjoyed it. So I took a number of classes there. And so today I'm unique, I'm strong in marketing, sales, accounting, and finance. But I will tell you, the things I learned at eight years old, I still use today. Now I've added a lot of skill around it in terms of you know, professional marketing, selling, accounting, finance, uh, organizational behavior, human resources. But still, the basics come from that kid selling fruits and vegetables. If you'd like to know more about this segment or any from this show or our previous episodes, go to our website, beoshow.com. There you'll find information and resources to help you in your new business venture. Still to come on Business Equity and Opportunities, we talk with a public relations firm which explains the importance of making brand awareness part of running your business day to day. This is Business, Equity, and Opportunities. Welcome back to Business, Equity, and Opportunities. The challenges awaiting you as a business owner include the way you handle your daily operations. When you're running your business day to day, you may not realize it, but you probably should include a plan to manage your company brand represents who you are. How and when you use it can often determine a company's success. 
This is business equity and opportunities running your business day to day. Deanna Hayworth, Chief Operating Officer for Hiron, shares insights into the ever-changing landscape of advertising and how it evolves to suit the needs of today's businesses. As you think about branding your company or your enterprise, we really want to think about it as storytelling. What is the best way to tell your story? Your brand goes far beyond what your graphic identity or your logo is, what your tagline might be. It's really what you own in the mind of your consumer or target audience. So having a really dedicated platform that manages your brand and um, someone that is that advocate is so important as you build your team. We find that in the advertising world, those that do best are those that have a strong business plan. So we can't go in with an advertising plan or a marketing plan and help a business that doesn't have very strong direction from their business plan. So it can't stand in that void. Um, so companies who might need to pivot, if they have a good solid business plan and advertising plan that they're working from can do that very successfully. We saw throughout the course of the pandemic that people had to change very rapidly, right? Their course was charted by what was happening in a world that was much outside of their control. And so those that had a really solid business plan in place were able to pivot the most quickly and stay ahead. As you're developing a marketing and advertising plan for your business, especially a, a newly formed business and maybe one that has high growth aspirations, we really encourage people to have a strong handle on their finances. So understand how much you can invest, what you need to do to move the needle as far as your growth goals go, and then build your marketing and advertising plan from that. So we want to be vigilant to make sure we're not having any waste in our ad spend. We wanna be as targeted as we can toward business goals that have been developed. So we founded Rural Reach just a handful of years ago. It's one of uh, the great examples of how Hirons has innovated to keep pushing and solving problems for our clients. We saw a real need for our clients, particularly in the federal government space, to communicate with rural audiences, specifically the rural poor. So our premise is that rural audiences need to be seen as specialized, just as we think about LGBTQ plus audiences, senior communities, low income, marginalized communities, that rural audiences deserve to be seen as separately and communicated with in a way that makes sense to them. Our industry in advertising and public relations changes every day. Probably the biggest thing that's facing our clients and our partners is just how fractured audience is now. So there are lots of media platforms, lots of different ways that people can access information. All of them can be at some cost to an advertiser, so it's really important for you to understand very distinctly your target audience, the market that you're seeking, and focus like a laser on that, because otherwise you can spend a lot of money and, and have waste to do something that maybe boosts your ego or tells your friends about your business, but doesn't really move the needle on your business development and growth. We're watching really carefully media consumption trends now, um, COVID and the pandemic and sheltering in place created some change in media consumption that we're really trying to see if it's going to stick or not. So broadcast television, for instance, became much more an active part of people's lives because they were looking for real information that was hyper local to their market. So are trends going to continue? Will people keep participating in media consumption in the same way or will it go back? The, the young ones are the ones that are the real head scratchers for me. I mean, if you think about those 14 to 18 year olds and how they consume media, it's very different than what any of us have experienced. So we're really closely monitoring those younger age cells to understand because they're going to be the consumers and our clients tomorrow.
Coming up next, our industry focus this week is on accounting and how to know when and if you need to hire a professional. That's coming up on Business Equity and Opportunities. I'm Scott Sander. Running your business, made possible by 1150 Academy. This is Business, Equity, and Opportunities. Welcome back. I'm Scott Sander. Each week on Business, Equity, and Opportunities, we focus on a specific industry in our community that you may either be interested in pursuing or one whose services you may need. This week, we're talking accounting. This is Business, Equity, and Opportunities, Industry Focus. Marshawn Wally, President and CEO of Black Onyx Management, shares his thoughts on the importance of a good accountant. When you're thinking about payroll and taxes, um, it's probably a good idea, particularly if you're starting out, to, to outsource that and let somebody handle your payroll. Um, it's very tricky. There's a lot of things that can go wrong with that. And so that would just be my personal advice to, to businesses. Um, I think it's also very important to have a sense of what's going on with your business, particularly like accounts receivables and what that looks like. And so having the appropriate financial controls and financial system. So understanding what, you know, that someone's producing a balance sheet for you if you don't know how to do it yourself, that someone's producing a profit and loss statement or a cash flow statement if you don't know how to do that yourself. Um, these are two key documents that you kind of always need to have. Um, banks will be interested in certain ratios like debt coverage ratios when it comes time to, to get a loan, but um, just understanding your numbers and knowing your numbers is key. One of the things um, that's really been helpful for me as in my business is having a great relationship with an accountant. You just need someone to kind of be looking over your shoulder a little bit to help you understand what your financials look like and to even plan for your taxes. Um, you know, you don't want a huge tax bill at the end of the year. You can plan for that, make payments over time. You can also understand what's going on with your business. Are certain business units or segments of your business doing well? Are they running flat? Are they going the wrong direction? And, and part of being a business owner is coming up with the ideas to, to improve your finances. And so um, you can't do it all. It, you, you need help, and one of the key areas that I think folks really should um, consider is getting a good accountant, a good bookkeeper to kind of help you with your financial planning. But one of the challenges, I think the first pitfall really is taxes. If you don't know what your finances look like, then you can get hit pretty significantly uh, with your taxes, either underpaying, which could be something that's consequential a couple years down the road, or not appreciating your tax liability as you're running your business throughout the year. Uh, I think the other piece is the missed opportunity. So I'm trained as an economist and I think about opportunity costs. If you don't understand your finances, then you don't know what opportunities you're missing when you're not paying attention to your numbers and what's going on with the business from a, from a financial perspective. One of the uh, opportunities I think we have as black entrepreneurs is to find ways to hire more people. And in order to get there, you have to understand your finances. And that involves just quite a bit of financial planning and understanding, you know, when is it time for you to grow your business by bringing someone on that makes your 40 hours a week, 80 hours a week, because you have somebody else working alongside you. Growing your business is gonna be key for our community, um, in part because black businesses hire black people. And when we think about structural unemployment in our community, not only here, but nationally, this is one of the key ways that we can move our community forward.
Coming up next on Business Equity and Opportunities, former football star Gary Brackett tells us about his journey from the playing field to the boardroom and how he ties it all together with his new business venture, Champs CEO. Stay with us. This is Business, Equity, and Opportunities. Welcome back to Business, Equity, and Opportunities. Up now, the segment we like to call our success story. Each week, one of our contributors sits down with us to share moments from their personal history that have helped shape where they are in business today. This week, it's Gary Brackett's turn. Over the last few weeks, he has shared some of the tips that he uses in his Champ CEO classes. Now we shine the light on his business journey. This is Business, Equity, and Opportunities. Success Story. Former Super Bowl champion Gary Brackett is now a leadership coach and founder of Champ CEO. His journey from the football field to a successful career in business has been interesting and inspiring. As a kid, I feel like I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, I see my father on the weekends uh, sell platters. Uh, he was a cook, so he would have rib dinners, chicken dinners. Uh, so it was something that our family was always um, a huge advocate of. Uh, as a kid, I can remember my first job was selling Rita's Wear Ice on the side of the road and being outside just you know measuring the cups and, and selling it that way, right? So um, it's something that was always instilled in me and I knew um, after college, uh, fortunate enough playing the NFL, I knew that's something that I wanted to kind of continue. If you look in your life in stages, and at every stage is 25 years, right? The first 25 years, obviously the high school, college, NFL, um, and then second phase, transitioning from the NFL, uh, going inside a business, um, getting my education, getting an MBA degree, um, being married, having a family, and then, you know, unfortunately seeing some of the roller coasters that occur. And I've never been a person that didn't expect to have adversity. So I feel like when I do face it, challenges, I feel like I can, I can overcome it. Because I don't walk around just thinking like, hey, everything is gonna be rainbow and shenzai and then no, nothing is never gonna go wrong. If you watch your stages in life, there's gonna be lessons at every stage. And for me, I want to always look at uh, failures, um, not as losses, but as lessons. And, you know, your successes, a lot of times, we would say, when we will win a game, we play awful, but we will win. We'll throw everything under the rug. Hey, we got to win. It's hard to win in the league. But, like, we won't correct any of the bad behaviors that <laughs> almost got us beat. But when we lose a game, play really well, we would just over-exaggerate everything that went bad. And I say that to say, like, it's never as good as you think it is, nor is it never as bad. And you can take lessons in the good and the bad. You just have to be patient and be willing to look back and review the tape and really understand like what could you have done better? And we had the opportunity to present yourself in the future, making sure you take advantage of it. My, my most rewarding challenge is as a father. Uh, my kids, um, they always tell me they want a dog. And, and I laugh and joke and say, I'm still trying to figure out humans. Like, uh, so I think um, I have a 12 year old, a 10 year old, an eight year old, or 13. And every day, just a different opportunity. And what I've learned is that I tell my kids, look at me more as a resource than as an authority. And I just wish when I was younger, I had the opportunity to fail more. And I see like this helicopter parents that always want to step in and kind of save their kids and help their kids. And I don't think it really sets them up for success as they get older. So for me, I want my kids to be problem solvers. So when they have an opportunity to challenge that presents itself, I want to know, hey, this is, that's a, that's a great opportunity. How are we going to, what, what do you think? Like, what are we going to do? What are the steps? And that helps them be problem solvers. That helps them think critical. And I think as they get older, they're going to value that skill. I think as an entrepreneur, one of the first things that you need to do uh, is set forth, one, what type of lifestyle you want to live, and second, what are your values? And if my values are um, being a family man and being a great father, then that, that should show up in everything that I do. 
So I don't think that you can just have this work life, this family life, this social life. I think, I mean, it's holistic. They all intertwine together. And the more you can really um, have values that kind of set forth uh, what you should be doing, I think it just becomes a lot easier to end and mix the two. There's also seasons in life where some seasons are gonna be a lot busier than others. And so you just have to be mindful of what season you're in and mindful of like what areas are you giving time to and what areas are you neglecting and making sure that you have a plan to adjust for those as the seasons change. It's funny, um, definitely have redefined my definition of success as I got older. Um, it's funny, I used to, if you had nice things, had a bunch of money in your bank account, right? That's success. Now I measure, measure success by my calendar and what I have to do versus what I get to do. And I think success to me is waking up every morning, being able to do what I love to do, um, helping people, serving people, not being forced to do anything. And uh, the monetary uh, rewards will come and they'll go. But your time, once that's gone, is gone forever. So for me, measuring success by the fulfillment I get out of life and how I allocate my time, I think that's what really what drives me. Thanks again to all the contributors who help us with success story in all of our different segments. We hope you find their information enlightening, useful, inspiring. You'll find more information about each of our contributors on our website, beoshow.com. A reminder, each week we provide seven full segments, each designed to offer information on topics of interest, both to business startups and if you're already operating a small business in our community. The topics range from how to get started and how to access capital to the day-to-day -day running of your business, as well as questions about accounting and bookkeeping. We feature business news and trends, and yes, always share a success story from one of our contributors. Join us again next week and every week for more insights into the world of small business on business equity and opportunities. You can watch the show here on Wish TV, or you can also catch a live stream on wishtv.com. You can access all of our content and share it on demand anytime, beoshow.com. We ask you to sign up for our business equity and opportunities newsletter to get even more valuable up-to-date information. And if you have any questions or you'd like to be part of our show, please email us. The address is beo at wishtv.com. We'd love to hear from you. I'm Scott Sander. Thanks for watching. Business Equity and Opportunities is made possible by Indiana Economic Development Corporation and 1150 Academy.